Check. 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 Good. Okay. I'd like to thank everybody who decided not to go get pizza, which was going to be delivered, they told me, at 2.30. So uh, basically what I'm going to talk about today is uh, developing tools that people want. We're going to talk about a variety of tools. Originally, I had scheduled this to be about an hour. Then I realized about half an hour of that was just ranting about uh, tools, mostly from Microsoft, that I didn't like, which you could get a lot of that anywhere, so I scaled it down a little bit. The uh, purpose of this presentation, basically, I've been working on a, a chip called the Serial Wombat for about five years. Started selling it about two years ago, went to some various conventions, the Hamvention and Dayton stuff, local around Indianapolis, talking to people. And basically kind of got a grip for what people like, what people don't. And what I want to do is try to just share uh, what I've found about getting people to adopt tools that you create. Almost everybody here, it seems like, creates you know, scripts or plugins or programs, you know, or even methodologies, stuff that they want other people to use. And, you know, it's very gratifying to get as many people as you can to adopt the stuff that you do. Now, the, uh, basically all tools, whether it's software or hardware, whether it's closed source, open source, they all have the, uh, have the same uh, sort of situations. There are in my opinion, two things that drive people to adopt your tools. One is a need. People say, boy, I've got a problem to solve. They all go out and get that. And that's fine. And if you can anticipate a need, create a tool, that's good. The other thing that tends to drive, uh, drive adoption is a wow factor, where basically people see something and you get this spark of empowerment, where people say, this is going to enable me to do something that I couldn't do before. And the fact that they don't necessarily need that thing, need to do that thing suddenly becomes unimportant. They want to do it anyway because they can. It's, you know, it's just our nature to say, wow, I can do something I couldn't do before and want to pursue that. There's a handful of features or, or factors to, to uh, a tool that I found tend to drive, drive uh, adoptions. My first few f efforts at selling things in person, trying to get people to, uh, to adopt them were, were unsuccessful because of various places where I fell short. The, probably the most important thing is your feature content. Obviously, you know, like we said, you want to solve some specific problem. You want to drive confidence to people. You want to make sure that those people know that what your tool is available. You want to give a perception of value, and that sounds like it's only commercial, but it also, you know, has uh, implications for free open source type software and interoperability. Some things are going to p scare people away from using your tools. If you have a poor reputation, that's, you know, that's very, very bad. Obviously, you, know, you look at something like Microsoft Vista, and people are just staying away from it in droves because of all the stuff that they've heard bad from other people. If it has a poor quality appearance, basically if it's not packaged somewhat nicely, and that's, that's going to vary some with your target audience, again, people are going to look at it and just walk away. High cost, obviously, is, is a barrier, and uh, questionable future. Like, we, see, we can go out on, uh, on uh, SourceForge and look at a lot of projects, stuff that looks neat, some stuff that even works to some degree, and look at that and say, wow, that kind of solves a problem I, need, I have. But you want to make sure that people feel like you're going to be there, your tool is going to be there, going to be available in the future if you want them to build it into any kind of larger process where they're really going to, you know, going to rely on it going forward. So how do you build confidence? Recommendations are, like, key. The single best thing that you can do is have somebody tell somebody else that the tool you created is a good one. You could talk to your blue in the face or, you know, talk on forums or whatever about how great something is. But if you get somebody who's not actually related to you to talk about it, that's much better. Uh, if you can show quality standards, that's good. You know, like uh, software people, a lot of us use test plans where you automate a regression test, you dump out a report. D if you do that sort of thing, get, you know, put it up there along with your tool so that people can actually show that you're doing that sort of thing. Uh, if, you're, uh, if you're capable, go open source. Obviously, people who can see what's in the guts of your product, you know, I don't have to, I don't have to preach that to this crowd. 
guarantees if your commercial is good. Basically, if people feel like you have a stake in their success, then they're going to be more likely to go with you. You know, like in my case, basically, if you don't like it, I'll give you, give you your money back. And, uh, you know, that, that helps. If you can future-proof things, basically make them expandable, extensible. The, you know, that's, uh, that's a big step towards building confidence. And then if you can conform to any kind of industry standards, that's, that's uh, top-notch. If people feel like they can leave you and go someplace else to pick up another tool, immediately that might seem like a barrier to, to uh, acceptance of you, but it really actually helps because it makes people not afraid to do what you're doing. So as far as recommendation goes, there's basically three places that I've found that, uh, that you can do. The first is if you can actually document somebody who's using your tools and show that, that's the best. Because like we say, you know, if, if I tell you it works, that's fine. If he tells you it works, that's something else altogether. Media coverage is good. You know, if you can get into a newsletter or something like that, that's better. But a lot of people look at those sort of things with a, with a uh, fair amount of doubt because a lot of, you know, a lot of news, if you get on Slashdot, that's great. If you get on a lot of the other stuff, you know, everybody who's done a newsletter knows that a lot of time at the end of the month or the quarter or whatever, you're scraping to fill, uh, fill information. So that kind of exposure is good, but people tend to take it with a uh, grain of salt. Testimonials are kind of the same way where you, have, where you say, hey, Bob said I have a great something or other. You know, nobody knows what your, uh, what your relationship with Bob is. So if you can get actual documents of where somebody succeeded with your tool, that's where you do the best. So features, we said features are the most, uh, the most important thing. You want to try to solve a problem. Pick one key attribute that's important to your tool and never, ever compromise that. If you can add features around the outside of that key attribute, that's great. If you find that any of your features are compromising that key attribute, that's not. And we'll look at a handful of tools that really have done this you know, in a great way, software and others. Quality standards and, and procedures, we talked about that. If you can show, if you can show, that, uh, you know, show that, you're, that you have an eye on quality, that'll pe make people more confident with you. Availability, find a good distribution channel for, that works good for your product. Something like SourceForge is great. If it's something that actually has to be sent through the mail, eBay is good but is, is declining in popularity. You know, basically that's a place where you have to learn about you know, optimizing for searches and, uh, and things like that. Professional distributors can also be useful, but you have to be prepared. You know, they're, they're, they're going to want money of some sort. You've got to figure out where that's going to come from. And a lot of times, if, you know, if it's a physical thing that you're selling, then it's going to uh, eat into your margins a fair amount. You want to make this decision carefully, because if you actually get to the point where some people are using your stuff, and they know I can go to this place to get it. If you move that, it's almost like when a store you like moves, you know, even if it's just down the street, you drive by, you see an empty storefront, you might just keep going. So that's, you know, that's something you, you want to put a lot of thought into that right at the beginning. The other thing you want to think about, is there anything that's going to limit you going forward? Like in my case, I sell chips. The, when I finally got ready to start releasing, I upgraded to the latest greatest version their their chip just because I knew that it would have the longest lifetime before the chip no longer became available. Be careful of anything that you would put in to a product that might limit it. Obviously we can look back on that like at the Y2K stuff that's probably the best example ever where people thought okay here's a tool that I've got they didn't think far enough into the future about how people would be using it and you know without a lot of help those tools exploded. Another great example of that, everybody knows probably that Windows XP Service Pack 3 is, is uh, coming out. One of the big reasons for that is that Microsoft actually ran out of registration numbers. XP lasted a lot longer than they expected. Now it's easy for them you know, to roll a new version of that sort of thing, but if you have a serial number or an ID number or something, really think in large terms, you know, don't use a 16-bit number if you think you're gonna end up running more than uh, you know, more than 65,000 of these things, something along those lines. So just look at what you're doing, make sure that, it, that there's no unnecessary arbitrary limits. Perception of value is important. And primarily you tend to think about this in terms of commercial products. People tend to put, for some reason, people put a lot of, lot of 
value into the money that they actually have as opposed to what they could earn. But it, uh, you know, it also applies to open source stuff. Like for instance, there's a lot of people out there where if you create a utility of some sort that they have to compile, they may just walk away from it as opposed to if they can get a binary. You know, and we're, talk, you know, we're shooting at that point at kind of the least experienced newbie type people. But you, what you're saying to them is, even though I'm going to give you the software for free, I'm expecting you to invest time to compile it, and if they're experienced with that sort of thing, potentially go through a dependency hell to figure everything out that they need to pull in in order to make it. So anytime you're doing a tool, you want to look at what the real total cost is that you're asking of your user. The value of a product is going to vary depending on what, what your use case is. What are you creating? You know, if, uh, if you're creating something that's truly expendable, like, you know, like an inkjet refill, then there's one expectation. If you're creating something that people are going to use very occasionally, like a disk partitioning program, you know, now a lot of us here actually use that a lot more than the average person, but then that creates another, uh, another set. Something that you use qu very often has yet another set of expectations. So you have to ask yourself, how am I, use, how am I creating the use cases for this, uh, for this particular tool? And for the way that they're going to be using it, is, is it basically worth their effort? And if it's something that you're selling, is it worth that cost? Interoperability. Good tools work with other tools. Conformance to standards allow you to plug it into other products' niches. We talked about that just a little while ago. People like to be able to throw out your product and plug in somebody else's product if they decide they don't like you. Uh, similarly, that works both ways, though, because they can pull out your competitor's product and plug in. It basically reduces risk if you can feel like there's an alternative. So some examples. And we said before that the single most important tool is that thing about a tool is picking a fundamental attribute. So like the Swiss Army knife, they decided to make something that was very sturdy, very highly portable. It has a corkscrew in it. That corkscrew is not as good as, a, uh, as one of the ones that you drill down and push down. It has a knife in it that isn't as good as a bigger knife that fits into a sheath. It has a screwdriver that's not as good as a standard screwdriver. And e any one of those things they could have improved on. They could have made it bigger. They could have made uh, multiple... Uh, sizes of screwdrivers, but any of those would have compromised the key attribute, which was sturdy portability ness, if that's a word. My grandmother, a while ago, got me, I don't know if you've ever seen these on eBay, a Swiss Army hammer, which isn't actually made by the Swiss Army, but what it was was a hammer, and it had basically everything that you had in a Swiss Army knife in the bottom. Right off the bat, somebody said, wow, we're going to take a Swiss Army knife and we're going to add another feature. And in fact, from a point of view, it was more useful. My Swiss Army hammer was more useful than my Swiss Army knife. But the problem is it sat on a shelf because my Swiss Army hammer was not as good as my regular hammer. And it wasn't as good as my regular knives. And it had lost that fundamental uh, as attribute of portability. So now basically, you've got a tool that's good for absolutely nothing. The EPC is something that I've, I've gotten here recently that I'm very fond of. And this is an example of another tool uh, that I think is, is really, really cool because they picked a key attribute. And if I was going to say what that key attribute was, that it was a, it's a good second PC. And to read the pre-releases, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, articles about before it came out, people said, well, this is going to be a failure because, look, at, it's not as good as this Hitachi and it's not as good as this Sony. But the problem with a lot of those things was they were $1,200, $1,500, $1, which all of a sudden, for a lot of people, that's not a secondary PC. That has to be your primary PC. Yet that was too small. You know, like this one is, you don't want to do all your word processing or something like this. Asus did a good job picking out what they were going to do. They were like, okay, we're going to do 800 by 480, and that kind of sucks. And we're going to give you 4 gig of RAM, and that kind of sucks. And we're going to give it a 500 megahertz processor and half a gig of RAM, and that kind of sucks too. And the amazing thing happened was they put all these sucky things together, and something great came out. Because every way that it sucked conformed to the same fundamental attribute, which was making a viable second PC and keeping it within the small package within the small price. Perl is uh, 
one of my favorite tools created by a guy named Larry Wall. If you ever get a chance to read his State of the Onion uh, addresses, they're, they're absolutely awesome. And he's probably, in my opinion, the best person ever at defining what a tool should be. And his idea in, for Perl was to make easy things easy and hard things possible. Basically, to attack the, the stuff that people do the most often. Now, Perl is maligned often because it, uh, it's often called write once, uh, write only code. Basically, you write it, you can't read it back. But if you look at what Perl was, it was a glue language where you'd write little, often throwaway scripts to get jobs done. And you process data into something else, a job you'd only do once, and then you'd be done. And Perl basically has gone through a, a series of revisions, but they've never given that up. They've never said, we're going to make it easy right off the bat. The other, th the, uh, the other uh, attribute that he, that he values is no unnecessary limits, which we talked about before. Basically, there's no reason to limit somebody to 65,000 array elements if you don't technically have to. If you can go the extra mile, then they always try to do that. I'm a bit worried about the state of Perl, though, because they're going to Perl 6 which is going to change a vast majority of things, like the regexes that everybody love, and the Perl 5 regex has become, to a large degree, the standard across a lot of different platforms, and then some, some uh, platforms then add some various stuff to that. They're going to something totally different called rules, which in the past, Perl code has always been backwards compatible, and they're going to break that they're going to more structured programming, which means that the, uh, that the typical one-liner is not going to be quite as easy, as easy to do. Now, the Perl 6 will very likely be much better for people like Amazon who use vast, huge constructs of it to do very, very big tasks. But a lot of people cut their teeth on Perl because they need, uh, they need a way, basically, to take a regular expression and put it in a script. And I'm concerned for them that they're going to violate, that they're going to throw away their most fundamental attributes when they move to six, and that makes me, uh, that makes me concerned for that. Let's talk a little bit about the wow factor. The wow factor is the single best thing that you can get for a tool. Basically, it's that thing that happens where people look at it and they feel empowered. And the, uh, the, uh, the great thing about that is that they tend to tell other people. Now, let me, let me caution you a little bit here. The, uh, I'll, tell you about, I'll tell you one thing about my chip is that commercially it hasn't been a success. I'm not making enough to uh, even cover my website and my eBay store. But the fact that I'm helping people do stuff is like the primary driver before that. I get, at the Hamvention last year, I had a guy who actually waited in line to come up to me and tell me how irrelevant my product was. Basically, he's like, Serial's dead. You know, he waited 10 minutes in line to, to come up and tell me that. I couldn't believe it. You absolutely have to ignore that guy. There's, a, there's a, uh, a, a fable or a story or a parable or whatever you want to call it about these two guys that are walking along a beach. And all these starfish have been watch, washed up on the beach. And you know, the tide is going out. And obviously, they're all going to dry out and bad things are going to happen to them. And the guy takes, one of the guys takes one of the starfish and throws it back into the water. And, he, and the other guy says, why did you do that? Look at all these starfish. It doesn't matter. And the, guy, the first guy who threw it says, well, it mattered to that one. If, you know, if you're not looking to make a gazillion dollars, that's really the attitude to take towards your tools. If you create something that you create, you liked it, you give it to somebody else or even to yourself, and it does whatever it's meant to do, at that point, it's a su success. Don't let anybody tell you that what you created is irrelevant. Highly affordable is good. How can, I how can I afford not to buy one? Or if it's open source, if it's free, how can I afford not to do it right now? So, cutting edge. Can I do something most people can't? I don't know, has anybody ever seen the, uh, the 3D rendering program Poser? It's very, very cool. It basically lets you pose these people and, and render them. And, uh, you know, in, in three dimensions from a wire mesh. Back in, like, I, I got Poser 1 back in, like, 1996. And I posed these people and I rendered them. And I just thought this was like the coolest thing ever. And I showed my friends. It's like, look at this, I can do this stuff. And never really ever created a useful graphic with it at all. But I did all this stuff and it was like, it was like really, really cool to me all of a sudden that I could do to some degree the kind of stuff that the Toy Story Pixar people were doing. I could do it at home. You know, I showed it to other people. And so that's, you know, even if the people don't need to do 
what you do. The fact that they can do it sometimes is enough to drive some adoption. Impulsiveness is good for people who want to drive, who, who you want to drive adoption to. You want to make it easy for people to make a decision. It seems at some points you might want to create a bunch of different tools to apply to a, a bunch of different pe people. That kind of stuff can actually hinder adoption. Impulse is destroyed by choices. The harder people have to think about things, the less likely they are to jump in and do it. I would tend to argue, I think a lot of people would agree to me that that, with me, that that's one of the things that has hindered Linux on the desktop, is basically uh, you say, hey, I'm interested in putting Linux on my desktop. And I ask you, well, which one? What window manager do you want to run? This, that, and the other. And for somebody who doesn't really know, all they know is they want to get away from Windows. All of a sudden now, I've made them stop and think. They're going to say, well, gee, I don't know. Maybe I better go back. Maybe I better research that. And what are they going to do? They're going to go back and they're going to fire up Internet Explorer. And they're going to look around on their Windows machine and you know, think about it and keep using it. At least for a while, they're going to keep using it. That's another reason why I think that Linux has been so successful on the Asus PC, EPC, is that people didn't have to think about it. It came out of the box, ready to go. The drivers all worked. Basically, it's been phenomenally successful. And it, it shows that Linux on the desktop is very, very practical for the non-technical people if we don't make, make them learn to make a bunch of decisions that in the end, maybe they don't care about anyway. We showed that they, this has shown that they don't care necessarily about having Linux versus Windows, which makes me think even more that they probably don't care a whole lot about their various Windows managers or uh, which scheduler we use in the kernel, things like that. So that's the end. Can, uh, at this point, if anybody wants to go get pizza, we can do that. I'm also interested in uh, if anybody wants to pop up with a tool that excited them and talk about it, that's, that's cool too. Anybody? Okay, well, thank you for attending my, uh, my presentation. And again, thank you for staying here when there's pizza outside. <laughs>